In this video, we're talking about the comparison theorem for improper integrals and how to use the comparison theorem to say whether an integral converges or diverges. And in this particular problem, we've been asked to say whether the integral from 0 to pi of the function sine squared of x divided by the square root of x converges or diverges. So we have to say whether or not this integral converges or diverges using comparison theorem. So the comparison theorem itself sounds a little bit confusing, but it actually really isn't confusing. We can draw two conclusions from it. So what the comparison theorem tells us is it describes two functions, f of x and g of x, and it says that both functions are positive, so you can see that we've started to sketch the beginning of the graphs of f of x and g of x, and they're both positive above the x-axis. It also says that f of x is always greater than or equal to g of x. In other words, if we graph them, f of x is always going to be above g of x. If we can show the relationship between the two functions that way, then we can use the comparison theorem to say that if g of x, the smaller function, diverges, and we can show that, then it's going to prove that the larger function, f of x, also diverges. Because if you can imagine here, this is g of x, and we show that it diverges like this to infinity. If f of x always has to be above g of x, f of x can't converge to a particular value because it'll cross the graph of g of x. Instead, the graph of g of x forces the graph of f of x to come upward like this and also diverge. So we're starting with g of x and saying, if we can prove that g of x diverges, then it proves that f of x also diverges. Or we can draw the opposite conclusion and we can say, starting with f of x, if we can show that f of x converges to a particular value, so let's pretend here that it converges like this to a particular value, then because g of x always has to be below f of x, we can say that g of x also converges to a particular value. If g of x diverged, it would cross the graph of f of x, which we can't have. So in this first example here, remember, we're starting with g of x and saying if g of x diverges, it proves that f of x also diverges. In this case, we're starting with f of x and saying if it converges, then it proves that g of x also converges. Those are the only two conclusions that we can draw from the comparison theorem. Well, what results from that is sort of these two directives when we're trying to figure out whether or not the given integral converges or diverges. What we need to do is find a function that's smaller than the given function and show that it diverges. Because if we were able to do that, we'd be finding g of x, showing that it diverged, and proving that f of x, the given function, also diverged. So we can either find a smaller function and show that it diverges to prove that the original function also diverges, or like in this second case here, we can find a function that's larger than the given function, and if we can show that it converges, so if we find f of x the larger function and show that it converges, then we can say that the given function g of x also converges. So what we need to do is find a function that we can compare to the given function. So it needs to be similar to this function, but it needs to be a function that's either always greater than or equal to this function or always less than or equal to this function. So how are we going to find a function that's similar? Well, if you have a trigonometric function inside of your function, that's always a good place to start, especially with sine or cosine. Because remember, sine, the sine function, always oscillates back and forth between the values negative 1 and positive 1, right? If you graph sine of x on your calculator, you'll see that the smallest value it ever attains is negative 1. The largest value it ever attains is positive 1. In the same way, cosine oscillates back and forth between 0 and positive 1. In the same way, cosine oscillates back and forth between negative 1 and positive 1. So if we start with sine squared of x and we say that we know that sine of x is always going to be greater than or equal to negative 1 and less than or equal to positive 1. Now we can start working with it. So what we can say is that we know sine of x is between negative 1 and positive 1, but here we're dealing with sine squared, so we're squaring this value. Well, if we took a value for x that produced a negative result, right, between 0 and negative 1, and we squared that, we're going to get a positive result. So in other words, if we change this sine of x to sine squared, we're squaring all these values. We know that we're always going to have a positive value, which means that sine squared of x always has to be greater than or equal to 0 and less than or equal to positive 1. So what we could do is we could take the given series, sine squared of x over the square root of x, and we could compare it, we could take this value here on the right hand side, 1, we could compare it to 1 over the square root of x. So we took the right end of the interval, 
we know that sine squared of x always has to be somewhere between 0 and 1. Well, remember that when you increase the value of the numerator of a fraction and you keep the denominator the same, the value of the fraction is going to increase, right? If we just look at, for example, the value 1 fourth, if we keep the denominator the same and we keep increasing the numerator, so we say 2 fourths, 3 fourths, 4 fourths, etc., well, the larger we make the numerator, when we keep the denominator the same, the larger the value of the entire fraction. So if sine squared of x is somewhere between 0 and 1, if we take the value 1 at the very right edge of this acceptable interval here, then we can say here that this fraction is always going to be greater than or equal to this fraction. So we're going to use 1 over the square root of x as our comparison function, and what we just did here was we found a larger function because we said that 1 over the square root of x is always going to be greater than or equal to sine squared of x over the square root of x. So we found a larger function, which means if we can show that it converges, right, find a larger function and show that it converges. If we can show that that converges, then we can prove that this integral also converges. If, on the other hand, we had found a smaller function, we would need to show that the smaller function diverged in order to prove that this integral also diverged. But because we found a larger function, we're hoping that it will converge, because if it does, we can prove that this integral also converges. So instead of taking the integral of the given function, we want to take the integral of this comparison function. So we're going to say the integral from 0 to pi, the same limits of integration, of the new function 1 over the square root of x dx. And we want to figure out whether or not this integral converges or diverges. So keep in mind here that the integral of 1 divided by the square root of x, this is going to be an improper integral. And the reason is because this function is undefined at the edge of the interval for which we're taking the integral. So we're taking the integral from 0 to pi. This function is undefined at the left edge, 0, because if we take the square root of 0, we get 0. 1 divided by 0, that's undefined. So we can't actually take the integral from 0 to pi. What we have to do instead is take the limit as a approaches 0 of the integral from a to pi of 1 over the square root of x dx. So we replace that value that was undefined with a, and we're saying take the limit as a approaches 0. Keep in mind that we have to say as a approaches 0 from the positive side, because the interval we're interested in is between 0 and pi. So if we were to graph that interval, here's an xy coordinate system, here's 0, here's pi, we're interested in the interval here between 0 and pi. So if we are approaching 0 from inside of the interval, we are not approaching it from this direction, because that would be outside the interval. We're approaching it from this direction, because that's inside the interval. So we're approaching it from the right-hand side or the positive side, so we say take the limit as a approaches 0 from the positive side, and we just replace that 0 with a. So now we can go ahead and evaluate this integral. First of all, 1 divided by the square root of x. Remember that the square root of x is the same as x to the 1 half power. If we move that x to the 1 half power to the numerator, the exponent becomes a negative, and so what we end up with is the limit as a goes to 0 from the positive side of the integral from a to pi of x to the negative 1 half dx. Now we can integrate by adding 1 to the exponent, so we'll say the limit as a approaches 0 from the positive side. Adding 1 to the exponent, we get negative 1 half plus 1 is positive 1 half, so we get x to the positive 1 half. Then we have to divide by the new exponent. So we have to divide by positive 1 half. Dividing by 1 half is the same thing as multiplying by 2. So we multiply by 2, and then we're evaluating this over a to pi. Remember that x to the 1 half is exactly the same thing as the square root of x, so we can call this 2 times the square root of x. Now we plug in our upper limit of integration, pi, and what we'll say is the limit as a approaches 0 from the positive side. Plugging in pi, we get 2 times the square root of pi, and then we subtract whatever we get when we plug in our lower limit of integration, a. So plugging in a, we get 2 times the square root of a. Now we want to take the limit of this as a approaches 0 from the positive side. So if a is approaching 0, we're going to get 0 in here for a. The square root of 0 is 0. 0 times a negative 2 is still 0. So what we end up with here is, we can say it this way, the integral from 0 to pi of our comparison function, 1 over the square root of x 
dx is going to converge to, or going to be equal to, 2 times the square root of pi. So remember, we said that that comparison function, 1 over the square root of x, always had to be greater than or equal to, or was always greater than or equal to, the original function, sine squared of x over the square root of x. In other words, we found a larger function. Because we found a larger function, we needed to show that it converged. And here, we did show that it converged. We showed that it converged to 2 square root of pi. We took the integral of that comparison function over the same interval as the original function, so over 0 to pi, the same interval, and we showed that it did converge. So because we found a larger function and we showed that it converged, we have this second case here whereby we can say that the original function, which is smaller because sine squared of x over the square root of x is always less than or equal to 1 over the square root of x, we can say that this integral also converges because it's going to be less than our comparison function, and the integral of our comparison function over the same interval was convergent. And that's how you use the comparison theorem to show whether an integral converges or diverges. Could you use some extra help with math? Click the button to head over to calculusexpert.com. It's where I've collected and organized all of my best resources, including exclusive videos, notes, quizzes, and even formula sheets. It's the perfect resource whether you're struggling, or if you want to take your learning further, or even if you just want to save yourself some time studying. So check it out, because I know it'll help.